she wants me to give her three more minutes. <laughs> a couple of things about the sale that I've okay. been able to do with the players. So those of you that have met with me one-on-one, -on -one, whether it was a coach, parent, or athlete, as you know, when we have those meetings, I'm all about solutions for you. I don't mind hearing the scenario of what's preventing you or your child or the coaching for the best, but it's always in time with solutions. And I always encourage you to sell those, share those solutions with your child, the athlete, the coach, but I want to empower you. And those, I think, have been going quite well. Uh, we've been having that with Kathy's meeting, and the next thing that's going to happen is I will be shortly uh, this weekend sending to Stormy. I have the report card designed for every captain. So the captains met and worked through what they thought were key behaviors for them as leaders for their team this season. And I've created a report card where I've listed for that particular team their seven or eight behaviors they came up with in their language and a checkbox of they do this some of the time, all the time, none of the time. Then there's space for the athlete and the coach to write down Here's what my captain is doing well, and please keep this up. Here's what I'd love for my captain to stop doing. Here's what I'd love for my captain to start doing. And so I will send an email to coaches to explain how to administer this, and then all of the report cards will only come to me first. And I'll review them all, and then I'll have another round of captain's meeting, and captains will talk about your leadership once again. I've also been working a lot with the 17 team. We're going to have another team session sometime next week. Um, so it feels really good to be touching so many parts of the program. I really appreciate that. For tonight, I'm going to take you through some slideshows so that you can see what was it like to be at the Paralympics in Rio for 21 days through the eyes of a sports psychologist. And I'm hoping a couple things happen. One, what I experienced was exactly what the Olympians went through. I just happen to be with the disabled athletes or Paralympians. And for some of you young ladies that will most likely play some level of volleyball in college, even if you don't go to an Olympic level, you might travel international with your team. And I want you to sort of feel what it might be like if I ever did any college volleyball and got to go international with the team. I know some of you have already traveled internationally with your family or maybe a school trip. But to be part of the team, I want you to experience that. The other piece is, I want to raise your awareness around just how gutsy Paralympians are. It will amaze you what you get to see what they do. So I have a series of slides from when we all flew to Houston, Texas for processing all the way to the closing ceremony. And I have a couple movie clips where I'm going to show you disabled athletes in action, and I promise you it will blow you up. Now from a contest perspective, I want to set the stage. So two years before the Rio Paralympics, the Wheelchair Bath Association contacted me and said, would you be willing to come on board and be our sports psychologist for men and women's United States wheelchair team? I say absolutely. But the coaching staff and I have to have the same philosophy around mental training team dynamics. And what it was is number one, every athlete has to do the hard work. You gotta put in the time. You gotta learn the skill of build. Once you've done that, and you play at that level, the difference becomes mental. And you have to prepare mentally during the whole two years before we go. And so I need to know that as coaches, you're going to support that when your team comes to Colorado Springs for training camp or for competition, regardless of what the schedule is for practice time, there will always be an hour of mental training work in the classroom with journal books. There will always be an hour of team dynamic work with learning journals and the book. There will always be an hour working with the captains on leadership. There will always be an hour where the coaches are open to feedback about their style of coaching and how it's working and not working with these athletes. There will always be time for athletes to have one-on-one. -on -one. That's a huge investment because that requires coaches to give up floor time. And you know what? They bought it. They bought into it full steam. And it was remarkable how both the 
these teams developed the secret sauce. The men had not won a gold medal in wheelchair basketball for 28 years. The women had won some medals, they won the gold, but it hadn't been for a couple Olympics. And we were very fortunate that two weeks prior to the Paralympics, the able body Olympics took place. Same village, same place. Our men and women able body basketball teams in the United States both won the gold. Because both of our Paralympic teams for USA won the gold. It's known as a clean sweep for the United States. And the fun part about it was having the Paralympics following the Olympics, when it got to that final gold medal game with the men, and we knew we had a clean sweep, all the fans from the United States in the stands had these little sweeper brooms, and they just kept their, their cheers were using the broom to cheer us on because we knew we were gonna have a clean sweep. So I'm gonna walk you through the processing, traveling to Rio, um, the culture of Rio de Janeiro, the haves and have nots of Rio, the village, uh, show you some of the competition, and then I'll show you a couple movie clips. So are you ready? Oh, yeah. All right, let's let the games begin. So um, our video gentleman is doing the best to not have this look like jaundice, but this is the best we've got so far. <laughs> I'm going to sit down because there will be some slides that I want to blow up for you. So I'm going to just talk from my chair here. So what happens is, is you have all of the Paralympians find their way, whether they live in Florida, whether they live in Arkansas, whether they live in Arizona, to, to Houston, Texas, where we are processed. Processing is one giant Christmas with 10 different Christmas gifts coming at you all the time. So we all fly to Houston, we're at a hotel, but we actually go to a convention site to get processed, meaning get all of our gear, all of our practice gear, all our luggage, all our watches, all our rings, all our shoes. And so in this huge convention hall, people like Nike had a whole room dedicated to Nike. Another room is Omega Watches. Another room is Oakley Sunglasses. And so you come downstairs, and when you go into this room here, they have the word Houston. They asked all the athletes to sign this board. Rio's behind, and they've got music playing. There's all kinds of young people, and Paralympians are meeting other Paralympians from different sports, and everybody's getting excited. We've all arrived in Houston. And then the announcement comes that, coaches, we need you to start in room one and continue until you're done with room 10. And then make sure your luggage that you want to go to Rio is in the processing room by 4 o'clock because your buses are leaving at 6 to go to the airport in Houston. Athletes, you're going to start in room 10 and go backwards. So, okay, let, let's start the gifts. And so here's what goes on. They did a board here that I'm going to try to look a little bit where they actually had, I don't know when you see this, but each one of these spots was a name of an athlete in the state they were playing for the Paralympics. So already the athletes are going, well, this is cool. Wow, this is all about me. They really like that. And so now, here we go. I go into the ring place, and they say, pick out your ring you want. So well, I pick out a nice little Super Bowl ring that I get to have. Especially since it's my team won the gold. They size it for you. Where would you like to have this ring be sent? Do you want the gold? Do you want the platinum? Do you want silver? What would you like? And I'm like, oh my God, you're kidding me. I haven't even competed yet with my team. And you're giving me all these gifts. So we go get our ring size. And now we get luggage. And we all got two huge bags of luggage just full of practice gear. But here's the challenge. If you notice, all these bags are exactly the same. Oh my gosh. Picture Landing in Rio, the luggage is going around the luggage stand. You've got people in wheelchairs, you've got blind people, you've got people with one leg, one arm, you've got a blind person, no arms, one leg, and everybody's looking for their luggage. <laughs> it was a nightmare. So we have luggage bags. Oh, and do we get shoes? I have more shoes now to last me forever. And everything is customized to your size. What would you like? So there's shoes. And there's one of our many podium outfits because the 
sponsors all want us to look really good. So we know certain clothes are worn at this time, certain clothes are worn at this time, and you got all these outfits. I was always so nervous when I went to the game if I would have the wrong clothes for the men's coaching bench versus the women's. But I always brought all my clothes with me. I thought I was going to spend the night in the gym, but I'm just too nervous. We took our shirt and we keep our shirt out. Oh my God, I'm so excited. <laughs> So then I go to the Nike room and I walk in and a young person, the iPad says, your name? Yes, I'm Dr. Bert Krause. Oh yes, here you are. You're the sports psychologist with your basketball. Uh, Mary and Beth are gonna come take care of you. Mary and Beth come and pick me up. They take me to my very own dressing room. They have all my clothes lined up. They have my name on the glass window. And every shelf has clothes. And they just want me to try on, do I like the fit? Do I like how it looks? Would you like a different size? Would you like us to take a hem out of those shorts? Would you like us to make the shirt tighter? What would you need, Dr. Krause? And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I'm overwhelmed and it's only like nine o'clock in the morning. I've got nine more rooms to go through. So there's my setup, all my clothes laid out, my shoes and whatnot. And this is one of our ceremony outfits. We were sponsored also by Ralph Lauren. And Ralph Lauren had seamstress right there. And they had a separate room with 50 different sewing machine seamstress. So as you tried on various podium outfits, and the designer said, you tuck the shirt in, you button three buttons, you leave the rest open, you put the belt like this. If you didn't like anything, they just met you right there, and we fitted it, and you picked up your outfit by four o'clock in a beautiful Ralph Lauren garment badge. It was all taken care of. This is one of our many outfits. This is also the uh, head coach of the women's wheelchair basketball team. So these are two bags. And the good news is I knew we were going to get a lot of clothes. So in the spiritual transparency, when I flew to Houston, I had one little bag that had personal undergarments on it. But I didn't bring anything else because I knew I would have too many clothes. In fact, they gave us so many clothes that another convention room was for UPS. They had huge boxes, so if you brought too much stuff to Houston, or you want to st send stuff home from Houston, you didn't want to take to Rio, they boxed it up and shipped it home to your house before you even left Rio. So I am finally done going through all my clothes. I'm a little overwhelmed, and I find this table, and I lay out my practice gear, because I gotta do something, what am I gonna take? Oh my God, not this, but I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I had to go take a break. I had to pee all the time. It was just so hard <laughs> to make these decisions with all these clothes that I had and clothes that fit me at six foot two. So then there's more gear for us, more sweatsuits. This is all the stuff that has been tailored for you. And then we turn in our luggage because the big bags are going to be taken on a separate shuttle to the airport that we will pick up to then go through customs. So the only thing that we're taking on our own bus is like a backpack that we have to carry. So this was our clothing ceremony outfits, and this is where I had to, this was my outfit they gave me, and I had to make sure I had two of the three buttons buttoned. You had your belt here. They took the hem down on my shorts, and you had to roll up our sleeves, but we actually practiced dressing for closing ceremony. <laughs> and then we go, and Oakley Sunglass guy says, oh, you're a coach? Hey, pick out two pairs of sunglasses you'd like to have. Go ahead. What would you like? And we get Omega watches. The Athletes got a $3,000 watch, and we got these beautiful watches here. And the uh, Athletes got their watches measured and cut for them and all delivered. Now, fast forward, we have to do the same thing when we leave Rio. You have to process out of Rio. So this is one of many trucks that has people's bicycles, racing wheelchairs, all being boxed up at the village, ready to go back to the airport to get sent back to the United States. And when you are processing out, you went downstairs in the apartment complex you were assigned, and there was at least 15 United Airline agents on these tables. And you checked in, you checked your luggage, and what's amazing about this, that I really admire about paralympians, everybody's in charge of their own luggage. There's, there's no victim, I need help, you handle it. That is your job, and they just do it. So what you end up seeing is things like this. So here's one of what's her athlete. She's in her street chair. She's pushing her athletic chair. 
She's got her spare wheel on top of the chair. She's got one bag of clothes here. She's got another bag. She's got a backpack. And she's going to make her way through the airport. And she's in charge of all that gear. And nobody complains. I'm like, really? I was so impressed. At the Rio airport, all the workers wear rollerblades because they can get around so much faster. I'm so impressed with them. Here's the guy with the rollerblades skating away. And then because we pretty much all the countries were leaving within the same two days, they had this great board up at the Rio airport where you could take a sticky note and you could write a thank you note to an athlete, to something the country did. It was just a nice way to close because when you are a Paralympian, you have to get to your international airport much longer than you would have to get there because it takes so much longer to get through customs to board an airplane. So you have a lot of dead time at the airport. So we got to go ahead and write these thank you notes for folks. Okay. Let's go to traveling to Rio. So I don't know if you can see well enough, but from Houston to the airport, they actually blocked off the interstate. We had 15 vans in a row and about eight motorcycles. And what's kind of cool is the first motorcycle races up ahead and blocks the next, next on-ramp to the interstate. And then we all go by, and the next motorcycle blocks the next on-ramp. Cars could go on this side and here. Our buses were red, white, and blue, but they didn't say Paralympics on it. So if you weren't well in the know that it was a Paralympic time, you might have thought we were prisoners going to jail. Maybe we're a lot of politicians. I thought it was kind of really cool that we had all of this uh, private road to go to the airport. And here we are in line to check our luggage. And once again, you are in charge of getting your own luggage through security. There's our men's team getting ready to board, women's team, we took a public flight, and watching wheelchair athletes board a plane is fascinating because one, as you can see, they're all lined up down the tarmac. And when they get to the end, you know how you can check your bag if it won't fit in overhead and you pick it up later on, get a little pink tag? They would wheel their chair there, and the flight attendant comes with a skinny chair that goes down the aisle. We unbuckle you. We get you in this chair, we strap you in, we take you to your seat, we unstrap you, put your seat, and then we go get the next athlete. That takes a long time. If some athletes felt like, I don't want to wait, they undid their belt, they hop on the floor, and they just scooted to their seat. The athletes where their body ended right here, they just put their arms up, and an able-bodied coach came down, hugged them under their arms, they hugged the coach, and they just carried them to their seats. And being that the flight is as long as it is, athletes have to make a decision about what they want to do about they need to go to the bathroom. Some of them capitalize themselves. Some of them have a suitcase just full of diapers. They're just like, you know what, I'm just going to let the bladder go and wear diapers, five, six pairs. Some of them will wake up an assistant coach, that's one of the job assistant coaches, and they will take that skinny chair and flight, go down, we'll unbuckle you, get you the chair, take you to those ridiculous doors for the bathroom and help you get in, wait for you, and then take you back. So the assistant coaches never sleep on the flight because they're there to help the athletes. The good news was is we were able to board before able-bodied people. And here we do, we land in Rio. And you had to get used to that there are men with machine guns everywhere all the time. At first a little spooky, but then actually you feel kind of safe that they're around. They were everywhere to meet us. Is this working for you so far? Am I pacing everything? All right. So now let's go to, we're traveling around Rio from the airport to the village. And this is sort of going through the haves not parts of Rio. When you're driving from there to the village, you are seeing houses on top of houses. Uh, again, every intersection, there are always men with machine guns. This is what you're seeing on the way to the village. And you know, for us in Little Ocaro Springs that can afford to play club sport, uh, this is a little bit of an eye-opener to see that people live their life like this all the time. 
Look how crowded that hill is with the houses. So we had one day, only one day, that we could go and actually see Rio de Janeiro. And we did have to bring one outfit that had no Nike, no Ralph Lauren, no USA, because they don't really like us there. And we were always told to have robbery money on us. So I always slipped like $10 in my shoes. So in case we got held up, we could give them something. So on the one day that we went to uh, see, we went to the Habs part of Rio. We went on the other side where the rich people lived. And we went up in a big bus to a statue called Christ Redeemer. Anybody know about that in Rio, Christ Redeemer? We just called it Big Jesus. <laughs> and what's interesting about Big Jesus is we got there when daylight left, but as the sun went down, Big Jesus got bigger. <laughs> And it's such a sort of spiritual moment. They have a lot of yoga mats that you can lay down and look up at Big Jesus. But people don't talk because they respect everybody's in a different place in their heart looking at Big Jesus. So here's what it looks like. There's Big Jesus. And I don't know if you see right here, but like this is like a moon here. That's how small it is. And then here comes nighttime. There's one of the Olympic arenas over there. We're looking at the lights. Now, there's a star over there. Big Jesus is getting more powerful because it's coming to be nighttime. Total darkness. There's the moon, and there's a star, and there's Big Jesus. Oh, my gosh, there's pitch dark. Big Jesus got really big. <laughs> and, and I'm a tall lady. And then, so, you know how we have the Manitou Incline and Fire Springs? Well, they have a thing in, in, in Rio that's pretty famous where a gentleman started tiling 240 steps up to some museum up here. And the governor kept trying to take his tiles away, and then people would send him tiles to put up, and then he'd take them away. And finally, the governor said, you know what? Even if we taxed him, every tile puts up, we'll get money for the city, and he didn't have his tiles. So they built this famous place, and there's just tiles everywhere. You can walk to the top. Uh, there's tiles that come from New York City, from Oklahoma, but people just send in tiles to see it. This is another one of our coaches. Some of the people are taking up a couple steps to see more of the view. Now, architect in Rio, you can be right next to an old, ugly, paint peeling building where they're doing drugs right out on the street, and right next to it is a beautiful cafe. And it just is all on the same block. So I'm gonna just go through a couple pictures here to show you some of the architect of the buildings. Pretty nice little hotel. Nice hotel, beautiful hotel. And right next to that is this infested place here. Right here, they were doing drugs. They asked if they wanted to buy any. I just said it stunted my growth, no gracias. <laughs> so the three coaches for women's basketball team and myself did this big tour of Rio. Two of the three coaches are in wheelchairs, and every time you get out to go see something, you have to unpack the chairs, you gotta get the wheels out, you gotta put them back on. It is an ordeal to tour on a wheelchair. And once again, these people just do it like it is my way of life. Very impressive. There's a gentleman, Rio, that had 40 days to paint a mural. This is the Olympic Village downtown where people could come, public people. And he started here, and this wall goes on forever, and it's about some of the culture history of Rio. One gentleman did this. He paid the whole thing in 40 days. So I'm going to show you the different pictures here as we go down the wall. He did that whole wall by himself in 40 days. And look at what they have in Rio. Ben and Jerry's. All right. And this is one of their famous trees they protect. I just wanted to get a couple pictures of some of their cultural things. Okay. Here's our village. The village had this incredible fitness center. It was this huge tent. It had state-of-the-art equipment. It was open 24-7. And I made a point of working out every day. But I started working out twice a day because I felt like such a wuss. I would be in there and see these people with no arms doing, you know, some sort of workout with their legs. I would see somebody that was blind 
doing a boxing drill, and they impressed me so much. I kept saying, Roberta, you are a wuss. Look at you. You've got to do more. You have to go. So I kept coming back over and over again, hoping somebody would notice. Wow, when you work out. But they, because we were there for about seven days before we started competing. And so they had to stay in shape. Big, big, big fitness center. The village is a bunch of apartments. Uh, slightly better than college dorms, but not a condominium whatsoever. And I was in a room with six people. There was myself and the female medical doctor for the men's wheelchair team, two of the men's wheelchair coaches, and then two able-bodied men's coaches. And we had our own bathroom, and then you just had some throw chairs, no TV, no nothing, um, and you went to a different place to eat. But there's dorms, and what they did was people would put a flag of their country off of their balconies here. And here's what's interesting. We were given instructions that as United States athletes, we cannot hang out a flag. Everybody else hung out flags. Do you think they could tell who we were? <laughs> um, around the village, we had an outdoor mall. And this had uh, different shops, post office, you get your hair done, uh, gift shop, McDonald's, a big sponsor, so all the food is free. And then local people came and did some cultural shows if you wanted to. You could hang out here and meet different athletes from different countries. And everybody was very cordial when we were in a social setting. And I always loved it when you, know, you might meet some basketball players from Argentina and you get done, you're like, hey, well, yeah, good luck, you two. They don't want you to have good luck, they want to beat you. But we all, we all say that anyway. <laughs> Nighttime view. So there's an example. They were doing a cultural show for us. Samsung had four free phone booths where you could spend five minutes calling anybody for free. And because I chose not to do an international phone or pay for that, I was always one of the regulars to go over there and be able to call home and tell them what's going on. So you can see here, there's flags of the country hanging out there, Turkey. And this is just some nice, you know, outdoor walking space with the mall. This entire apartment was Great Britain. They got a whole apartment. South Korea. Every apartment complex had a beautiful pool. Uh, sometimes used for water therapy, sometimes just hanging out because it was quite hot. There's that fitness center again. So, you know, we had about two to 3,000 athletes from about 130 countries in this village. And some days I would just sit and watch people because everybody was different, but everybody was the same in terms of they all had a disability they had to manage. Um, this was going to the uh, dining hall, and then every morning, even though we are in a fenced-in area, and we had to show a lot of security to get in back into our village, while in the village, we had a tremendous amount of security. And what's interesting is uh, we had housekeeping for each apartment building. And in the building next to us, the French were there. And they kept complaining about the food and about the clean service. We didn't get clean towels we're supposed to. Uh, they're not cleaning our bathroom. And so what the housekeeping crew did is they set the fire alarm off in the French apartment. <laughs> so athletes all are coming out the front door. The fire trucks are coming. And while that's going on, the housekeeper went in the back door and robbed them all. Because even while in our apartment, we had to keep things locked up. We had to keep our bedroom door locked. And in the bedroom door, we had to keep our luggage locked all the time. So this was our security all the time. Interesting, this is a gentleman, how he got along the village, he only has one leg, so he brought his handler with him. And she carted him around everywhere where he had to go. This gentleman here, interesting enough, this bike has no pedals or chain. But because of his lack of strength in his body, in his back, he kept a cushion here, and he leaned on a seat and just walked the bike, and that's how he got along. This is uh, some Muslim athletes staying true to their culture. As hot as it was, they only exposed their face and their hands. And you know, as you walk around and see people's prosthetics, I have to tell you, sometimes I walk by and I said to myself, I could make a better prosthetic leg in my garage than what they have. And other times, people had the state-of-the-art titanium where a guy is going, and I'm like, whoa! And, but you got to see it all. 
And they had a medical hospital here, and of course some of the poor countries when they came here, uh, they would go to maybe get a bag of ice or an arm, and they would say, and while I'm here, could you clean my teeth? Because they wanted to get as much medical help as they could while they were here. So just walking the village was an experience. This is our dining hall, and the dining hall keeps your breakfast food, your lunch food, and your dinner food out all the time because there's such a high need for the protein intake that Athens will have scrambled eggs, chicken, fish, and steak for breakfast. They'll have scrambled eggs, chicken, steak, and fish for lunch. And again, it is amazing to watch how people manage food. I watch some athletes that have no arms. So they come in with their team. They sit down at a table. The team gets them a tray. The food to tray comes. He says, hey, thanks you all. And he's down to start eating because that's how they make it work. Here's an interesting picture. This lady's body ends right there. Can you see that? And I was in the gym with her. This is one of those moments that I felt like a wuss. And she got underneath some rings and she kept swaying her body, her half body, and then she went, Hah! and she jumped up with her core and grabbed the rings. And my mouth dropped open and I said, get your ass in here, I start going. <laughs> Here's different country athletes. Um, they have the blind racing, and uh, being legally blind has different degrees of blindness, so to make sure it's all fair, the blind athlete has to wear recovery, and then they have a sighted partner, and I'll show you a movie clip here shortly of how important it is that they have the same gait, they have the same arm movement, but they run in tandem. They're hooked in here by a Felco strap. Athletes brought uh, different ways of getting around the village because this is about a two mile spread of this village. And I don't want to wear myself down if I am disabled. So they brought all kinds of motorized bikes to get around to save their energy for their competition. This gentleman here was the funniest guy and he was the shortest Paralympian. Look at that gentleman. He was just so funny. He loved life. There's blind athletes going to and from. There's an Algerian, Algerian athletes. Qatar. More blind athletes holding on to a chair. These gentlemen adopted me because they said that I was such a tall American lady. They were so impressed with that, so they kind of adopted me as part of their team. <laughs> this is the Algerian basketball players. What's interesting about this, again, staying true to their culture, uh, most of them would have their headdress and have long pants on and only have their face and arms exposed, and they played like this. And the problem was, one, they sweated a lot, and two, you already have blind spots when you're in a wheelchair for basketball, but having the headdress created even more blind spots for them that was really interesting to watch. These are some gentlemen practicing blind soccer. As you can see, the mask, so the ball has like a bell in it. They were so talented. I kept saying, how can you do that? Hmm. Here's some more blind athletes you can see doing a drill right there. Uh, riders get ready to go out for a trail ride. There's the women warming up to play us. This is interesting. This is a gentleman that plays volleyball from the Independent Republic. And I believe, and John, you might be able to help me. Is John Castle still in the room? He, he just stepped oh. off. Uh, this gentleman is eight foot one, and he plays sit volleyball. And uh, he's eight foot one when he stands on one leg because he has a normal leg, normal knee, normal calf, normal foot. But then his other leg is like only seven two. And I believe his real biological foot comes out right below his knee. So he has an artificial calf and then another foot. What's amazing was when he sits down to play sit volleyball, from his armpit to his wrist, he's six foot four. And so if you've ever had a chance to watch sit volleyball, when he's on the front line, you don't have a chance. And he has an illness where his thyroid gland has never shut down, so his face is about two feet long. Wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and they did quite well with him on their team.
here's some fun pictures that I sent back. Uh, this is the men's basketball coach for the women's Chinese wheelchair team. And he played professional basketball. He's about seven foot eight. So you know how tall I am, so you can kind of get an idea. What was interesting, the first time that I got to observe a wheelchair basketball game, I was feeling confident, but maybe overconfident, because I do understand the game of basketball because I played it. I was an alternate at the Olympics. But what I wasn't prepared for is in wheelchair basketball, you have to talk so much more. So when I was playing college ball, it was cutter, shots up, block out, rebound, switch. But when you play wheelchair, you're talking all the time and you're screaming. So the first time I was at a game, he was in the United States with his Chinese team, and we're playing them, and the game starts and all the hears, why do I go? And it, it just freaked me out. <laughs> I wasn't used to their language, and everybody yells at this. But this guy, he, he can stand under the basket, and he just, I mean, one hand like this, and he's touching the glass. It was amazing. But again, like the other gentleman, he was such a wonderful, kind, soft-spoken man. Um, so they had pretty good security in Rio, and the United States also brought their own security. And these two gentlemen here that I'm with were senior service gentlemen that were assigned to basketball 24-7. So when we would leave the village on a transportation bus to go to either the practice arena or the game arena, they were always there waiting for us. And they just dressed kind of casual. And I hung out with them a lot because after a game and the after shower, they always had about an hour reception so they could be in a room with any family members that were there because no family was allowed in the sport village. And so since I didn't have family with me, I would hang out with these two gentlemen. And what's interesting was, because they are from the State Department of D.C., and I have a brother-in-law that used to work there, I said to them, so let me ask you a question. Now, would you by chance know Martin Krause? Martin Krause? Oh, yeah, we know him. We work for him. So they gave me a gift to give to my brother-in-law that was a real Secret Service badge, I mean, heavy-duty gold badge. But the middle of it was carved out to make a can opener for beer. <laughs> and the girls on the team asked this guy, they said, can we see your gun? And you know what he said? It won the gold medal. So watch what happens. These are, you can volunteer to work at Olympics and Paralympics from anywhere in the world. You're being vetted, you have to pay your own way. But these people here, so in the middle are our men's basketball team with their gold medal. But all these people here are all volunteers just assigned to United States basketball. So when we come off a bus, there's a person here showing us to this door, and then this door, then this hallway, and here's your practice gym, and the balls come out this time, and these people all worked. Of course, they loved it because they got to be around a gold medal team. But this is how many volunteers it took to take care of us when we went to competition. This closing ceremony, this gentleman resides here in Car Springs. Interesting young man. He is, I believe, a track athlete. Uh, he was very able-bodied until a couple years ago where he got hit by a drunk driver. And now he speaks with a slur. He understands what happened to him, but he will say, I'm here to motivate people to be. And he has embraced it. He did his hair red, white, and blue. There's the coach and I. This is closing ceremony. Everybody has a flag bearer for their country. Dwarfism competes in the Paralympics. I think that's all for this. There we go. Okay. This is us winning the gold medal for the United States. I'm just going to kind of go through these and let you see all these. It's an incredible feeling. The women went 7-0 in their pool, the men went 8-0. So remember I said they said, let us see your gun? Well, when they won the gold medal, they said, let us see your gun. So the Secret Service guy pulled up his shin, and he had drawn a gun with a magic marker on his shin and said, congratulations, because here's his shoe. Because they cannot take their gun out of their back. <laughs> It's customary to give some sort of token from your country, so the girls got their gold medal and they got some sort of doll representative of the culture. It's 
This is the men's team. Look at, look at that. 28 years before they won a gold medal. You want to see grown men cry, win a gold medal. This is a gentleman that when I first worked with him, the coaches said, Doc, we need your help. This gentleman, because of spina bifida, has been paralyzed since birth, has started playing competitive basketball in some sort of rec league at age seven. He's 20, and she's been playing basketball for 21 years. And he throws up either before every game or during the first period. And in wheelchair basketball, you have a classification number. You're a 1-0, a 1-5, 2-0. Those of you that play tennis understand this. And it's all about your mobility in the chair. So if I am simply paralyzed with spina bifida, but I can move this here, I'm probably at four or five. But if I have nothing below this, and I'm strapped in here, and I can do this, I'm a 1-0. And at any time out on the court, when you add up the classification numbers of your five players, it can't be more than 14 points. But you can't stack your team with people that can do this. And uh, they needed him because of the classification number, and I said, give me two sessions. And uh, we worked through some stuff that was confidential, but I can tell you he stopped cold. And he was so excited. He went into ADD mode when he got on the court and the team went nuts. And he has not thrown up since. And he tells that story publicly. And he just was a changed man. He's been throwing up for 21 years. And he doesn't do it anymore. So we're pretty proud of him. One of the guys would do a head game and because the end of his feet was just kind of a uh, stub, he would wear his shoes one on the opposite way. <laughs> and of course, the first time I saw it, I was like, "Oh, Matt. And he said, see, I got you. He did it just to get in people's heads. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's do some videos. So this is going to open the ceremonies to protect everybody. And these uh, trucks are full of men with machine guns. It does get your attention. Here's the closing ceremony. We're on down on the floor and everybody has their cell phones up. And part of this is you're just celebrating that you made it here and you're participating. And of course, if you have a medal, that's an extra bonus. But it is so exciting to know that you are just with over 2,000 athletes from around the world, 130 plus countries competing. So here's one of those moments where I had to stay long in the fitness center because a gentleman with no legs was making me feel a little weak. See his legs? He did that for an hour and a half. Let's do uh That's the girls winning the gold medal. cycling for women with no legs. Look at that. Uh, I know we have some tennis players in here, so this is indoor doubles tennis, and you are allowed to let the ball bounce twice as long as it stays inside the court area. So we can see this. And you can play singles in tennis also. Um, our, our guys on our team really took the skill of visualization seriously. And every time we went to the practice gym, 
and they got in their athletic chair. Every one of them got on the court and did 10 minutes of visualization before we started practice. So here's an example of what they did. It shows you their commitment to mental training. net downs and won the goal, but how do you cut a net down when you're in a wheelchair? So I want to show you this clip of these blind runners. And if the sighted athlete is getting the blind runners set, you've got to get them behind the line, get their hands in our crosses. So they're going to first get the blind runners set, and then they will join them on the line and strap them. What happened to us, the gentleman in the white shirt leaned forward at the end and they lost their gaze. Here's a guy doing the shot put and he has to be in a little bit of a metal cage before he does this. Because he's paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, this is a closing ceremony where a girl is walking on her own with no legs. And then, th I'll show you this and I have just one more picture. Um, this is the men's raising the flag here. They're going to go now. What they do is they put the flag up in this. Now, if you notice, there's a lot of empty seats because once it was over with, people don't even see the Americans get a gold medal. Um, very formal ceremony. They come out, they're each given a medal. You thank the fans.
last picture you know we never get to know when as parents as coaches we want to have impact so this is my closing story I work at the Center for Creative Leadership and I was teaching leadership program and a mother from Kraft who said to me, gosh, I wish my son Adam could talk to a sports psychologist. I said, well, where do you live? She says, we live in Missouri. I go, well, he can call me anytime. He was a senior in high school and he was so talented that he had a scholarship for either baseball or wrestling. He called me up. Oh, hi, Dr. Krause, my name is Adam. I wish you could talk to my mother. We had this wonderful conversation. He sent me some tapes of wrestling, and I look at him, and I just call him back, and we talk about momentum. Graduates, decides to go to Iowa for wrestling, which is a big wrestling college. He's doing well. After his freshman year, he comes to Breckenridge to just mountain bike with a friend having a very successful freshman year in college. And I'm at work, I haven't talked to this mother now for probably a year and a half, and I go into my office, and I get this phone call, and I hear this, Hello, Dr. Krause, this is Mickey. And I thought, oh my God, that's that kid Adam's mom from a year and a half ago. Oh, this is good. Call her up. She says, Adam had a mountain biking accident in Breckenridge, has been flown to Swedish Medical Hospital. He's paralyzed from the waist down. Is there any way you would call him? I said, I will go meet him. So I go up to Craig Medical Hospital and meet this young man, and he's determined he's going to walk again. And he's doing all the PT, and he's fired up. And I said, when do you want? I'll introduce you to the Paralympics in Car Springs. Oh no, I'm walking again. So I cried a lot coming home from Denver because I wanted to help this young man. And I went to the Paralympic office and said, is there anything I can do? And he said, Roberta, until he accepts his disability, you can't do anything. Fast forward another year, I get a phone call. Hi, Dr. Krause, this is Adam. Uh, my dad and I would like to come to town. Would you show me the Olympic Training Center? He's accepted his disability. Took him to the training center. They had him practicing basketball. He met them. He got excited. And he decided to start racing in wheelchair marathons. And he got a sponsor, Sarah Lee, to sponsor him. And he's on his way. And he sent me this picture. I am doing fine. Fast forward about 15 years. I'm at the Paralympics. The women's wheelchair basketball coach is also the coach at University of Illinois in Champaign, which is one of the colleges that is geared towards disabled athletes. She comes home from Rio and she's talking to the men's track coach. He says, you know, we sent a Paralympian in track to compete Rio and he just didn't do well. God, I wish we could get him a sports psychologist. She says, uh, we had a great sports psychologist for two years. Uh, she's been with us through everything, came to Rio. And he said, who is she? He said, it's Roberta Krauss. Oh my God, she helped me when I was in high school as a wrestler. He is now the head coach for wheelchair track and field at University of Illinois. So he sent me an email to congratulate me, helped me team get cold and said, told me, he said, sometime when I come to Car Springs, can I come and see you? And I thought, boy, if there's a better message to stay in your field, that's it. So thank you all so much for letting me share this. Well, we got to have team cry tonight, so my kids are good because we do that before every practice. Um, there's not much, I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot. Uh, it takes a lot, actually, to render me speechless, but that kind of blows me away. Um, so I'm going to go work out. You guys have fun next door. I'm going to go work out for the next eight hours. But thank you so much. What an incredible experience for sharing that. Um, we are blessed. We are blessed to be able-bodied and... If ever we 